Look, I don't think we have to whine our way to the finish line and coast our way to glory. I believe the Lord has made it so that God's people can finish strong. In fact, that's exactly what I want to talk to you about tonight because when you come to Deuteronomy 33, you come to the parting blessing upon the children of Israel. I spoke to you yesterday morning on the Day of Atonement, last night on the year of Jubilee, and on this evening I speak to you on a lifetime of blessing. May I say to you, God has designed life not to be lived one day or one year, but to be lived all of your days in his presence. I think one of the great dangers in special meetings, you know there are dangers in special meetings. There are benefits, but one of the great dangers in special meetings is people get in their, in their thinking that somehow what God is doing is confined to a location or to a handful of days or to a guest speaker, and nothing could be further from the truth. Special meetings are not the end. They are the means to the end. They are to set something in motion that continues long after the meeting has come and gone. And I think one of the great tendencies in our thinking in our American Christianity is that we live for a day or we live for a year and we miss the lifetime. May I submit to you tonight, there is something better than a revival meeting. It's called a revived life. And if you can live in the presence of God, then you've learned the secret of his joy and power at all seasons. And so when you come to Deuteronomy 33, you come to the parting blessing upon the children of Israel that was to continue with them all through their lifetime and all through their children's lifetime, through the generations. In fact, there's a great deal of prophecy wrapped up in this chapter. And everything God foretells he always fulfills. You might want to write this in the margin of your Bible. You should study Deuteronomy 33 alongside Genesis 49. Because in Genesis 49, Moses gave, excuse me, Abraham gave his parting blessing, or Jacob gave his parting blessing to the sons, the actual tribes, the heads of the tribes. So, so granddaddy is lying on a bed, dying. That was Jacob who became Israel. And all the boys are gathered around his bed, and he individually blesses every one of them. But when you come to Deuteronomy 33, the boys have been dead for some time now. Moses is speaking, and he uses the boys' names, but he's not referring to them as individuals. He's referring to their tribes, to their families. And so he's giving a blessing. And like parallel tracks, almost like railroad tracks, laid side by side. I, I love it. Comparing Scripture to Scripture, you see the blessing going on and on and on from generation to generation. Let's read just a little. Look at Deuteronomy 33, verse number 1. Read the first phrase out loud with me, church. Ready? And this is the blessing. Would you mark that in your Bible? Isn't that a great expression? And how'd you like the preacher to get up and say, this is the blessing? So it begins with blessing. This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. I don't know about you, that's a pretty good verse right there. I mean, look at that verse. He loved the people. His saints are in his hand. They sit down at his feet, and every one of them receives of his words. I'd like to live in that verse. How about you? Verse 4, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. And then, beginning in verse number 6, he begins to give individual blessings to each one of these families, to each one of these tribes. Now, I'm not going to preach on all of them tonight. And all God's people said, yeah, it's all right to say amen, because it'd be a long sermon. In fact, I'm only going to speak on one of them, but let me just show you. you got a pen in hand? Mark them in your Bible. In verse number 6, you got Reuben. He begins with Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn, and this is beautiful. You want, a, you want a beautiful picture of the grace and mercy of God? Look, it's the grace and mercy of God. We're not all in hell tonight. It is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You want a picture of that? 
Look what the Bible says in verse 6. Let Reuben live and not die. Someone said, well, that's nice. No, you have no idea how nice it is. Because Reuben deserved death because of his sin. In fact, in Genesis 49, remember what I said about comparing Scripture with Scripture? In Genesis 49, the Bible says he was unstable and he would not excel. That sounds real positive, doesn't it? Yeah, when you come to Deuteronomy 33, oh, I love this. God says, let him live. Let him live. He doesn't deserve, he doesn't deserve all of the reward, but let him live and not die. And then, mark in your Bible in verse number 7, and this is the blessing of Judah. So you got Judah, of course, the tribe through whom the Messiah would come. The lion of the tribe of Judah would come from this family. Verse number 8, and of Levi, he said, and Levi gets quite a blessing. In fact, look at verse number 11. Bless, Lord, his substance and accept the work of his hands. We know Levi got a special blessing because this became the priestly tribe. By the way, time out just a second. Let me give you a parenthesis. May I give you a parenthesis for a second? If you take the, the names of the boys and look at the tribes in Deuteronomy 33, there is one missing. There is one missing. And I got to look at that, and I thought, why is he missing? And I tell you here, because always before, he was always connected to Levi. Anybody know who it was? It was Levi and Simeon. And Simeon's tribe is not mentioned here. Joseph's boys step in so that there's still 12 names given in this passage, but Simeon is not listed here. Do you know why? Because he rebelled against God. He took the glory that God was due from his family and brought stain and spoiled the good name of this family tribe. And so God just com completely omits his name from Deuteronomy 33. May I just say tonight, the blessing and presence of God is not something to be presumed on or trifled with. It is a sacred and sober thing. And every one of God's people better remember that. Then you come down to verse 12. you got Benjamin. Little Benjamin. Aren't you glad even little Benjamin gets a blessing? And then in verse number 13, you have Joseph. I wish I had time to show you this tonight because I've been studying it a lot recently, but this is the longest of the blessings. Mark it in verse 13. Blessed of the Lord be his land. And then, look down at verse number 16, at the end of the verse, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Oh, I love this. He says, he was separated from his brethren, but he was never separated from me. He had the blessing of God on him. And if you wonder why it comes on the head, look please, because anything that is poured on the head comes down to the whole body. So Manasseh and Ephraim, all the kids and the grandkids and the future generations knew the blessing of God because of God's blessing on Joseph. I'm thinking a great deal tonight about heritage with my uncle here. I, I really believe this. The longer I live, the more convinced I am of this. I believe so much of the blessing of God in my life and family right now is simply me reaping the blessed benefits of the obedience of those who came before me. I really believe that. Faithful grandmas and grandpas, holy men and holy women who walked with God and prayed and passed on something to the generation following, and I am the beneficiary of that. And might I say, I don't want to just receive that. I want to relay that to the generation following me. And then, in verse number 18, you come to Zebulun and to Issachar. In verse 20, you have Gad. Notice what he says of Gad. He said, blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. You see, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing. Verse number 22, you have Dan. Verse number 23, you have Naphtali. I like this. Old Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful expression? Full of the blessings of the Lord. And might I remind you, when God fills people, he doesn't fill them to fill them. He fills them to flow through them. Look, please, God doesn't just fill you so you can enjoy life. God fills you so he can overflow your life into the lives of other people. And God says, this man, this, this tribe, this family, they're full of blessings. And then we come to our text. He's last on the list. How many of you are glad with God the last is not always the least? <laughs> Remember what Jesus said, the first shall be last, the last shall be first? This is a good example of it. Look at verse 24. And of Asher, he said. I love this expression, let Asher be blessed. 
Would you mark that? Let Asher be blessed. Could I just remind you all the blessing God has to allow it to come because none of us deserve it. God says, let him be blessed. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from above from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Look, please, not a single one of us deserve a single one of heaven's blessed benefits, and yet the God of mercy and grace says, let him be blessed. Hmm. Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren, and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Asher is an interesting character in Scripture. Did you know that he is not the first of the boys and he's not the last of the boys? In fact, he's number eight on the list. <laughs> Somebody said, wait a minute, preacher. That means the Lord has them out of order. Friend, God is always in order. He does everything decently and in order. And if the Holy Ghost said to Moses, say it to Asher last, there was a reason for it. In fact, I really believe this. I think God saved some of the greatest blessings for Asher. Did you know that the expression here, let Asher be blessed, the, the wording that Moses uses in that, in that day, the terminology that he uses, the exact wording the Holy Ghost chooses literally means give him the greatest blessing. <laughs> That's powerful to me. I mean, look, here's a guy sandwiched in the middle. How many middle children are here? Would you raise your hand? How many of you middle children are here? God bless all the middle children. And we give Lauren a hard time in our family being the, the middle child and somebody says, oh, the middle children get neglected and get ignored and get forgotten. I love this. Here's Asher, right? May I use a technical term? Smack dab in the middle of this family. And yet God says, give him a special blessing. Here's Asher. You ever wonder when this was being read the first time, given the first time, when all the families and tribes were gathered around, if the family of Asher said, he skipped us. He skipped us. Hey, hold up. You missed somebody. This is not a footnote. No, this is an exclamation point. Look at it, please. Let Asher be blessed. What is God saying? God is saying there is a special joy and blessing I'm going to pour out on this man. In fact, that's what his name means. Did you know that? Everybody hold your place here a second. Put your, put your right hand at Deuteronomy 33, and we'll come back to it in a minute. Go back in your Bible to Genesis chapter number 30. Let me show you where Asher was born. Look at Genesis chapter number 30. This is, this is fascinating. This is Leah speaking. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 30 and verse number 13, And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me, what? Blessed. And she called his name, what? Asher. Here he is. His name. Oh, I love this. His name actually means happy. That's what his name means. I mean, here comes, here comes a baby boy, and mama holds him and says, I'm blessed and he's blessed. We're, we're just so happy. Now, you think, you think that every mother would say that to every child, little children are heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. But if you understood a little of the context of the passage and what this woman has been through and what God has broken through and what God has done for her, you would understand that this was overabounding, super joy bubbling up in her soul. She just couldn't contain herself and when she held that little boy she understood that not only was he a gift from God like every child is but it was a special grace and glory on her life and so she named him Asher which means blessed and so you connect his name go back now to Deuteronomy chapter number 33 you connect his name to what God says about his family and this is what's captured my my thinking look Asher is the last Asher is near the end of the list Asher is near the end of it all watch please and it's at the end that God says I'm gonna give special joy and blessing may I say to some end-time Christians tonight, I do not believe God's children have to be miserable until Jesus comes. Frankly, I've met a lot of miserable people recently. And you ask them if they know the Lord, and they always answer with a sigh. Why does everybody always answer with a sigh? Well, yes, I know the Lord. 
I call them Eeyore Christians. Everybody remember who Eeyore is? <laughs> Everything's bad. It's always on the down note. It's always in the minor key. And you say, well, has God been good? Yes, he's been good, but... Are you doing pretty well? Well, I'm doing okay, but you know, it's hard, preacher. Yeah, it is hard. Life is hard. Sin is hard. The world is hateful. The devil's on the war path. Yeah, I understand all of that. But let me listen to me, please. I believe that God has designed it so that as we near the end, as we, as we come to the finish line, look, that the last day's Christians, God makes a way so that we can enter in to his blessing and his joy can be our strength all the way to the finish line. Why is it God's people are moping and mumbling their way to heaven? Grumbling and groaning their way through this world when they ought to be speaking with the joy of Jesus Christ and speaking about the blessing and the goodness of their God. A day of atonement? Yes, praise God. A year of jubilee? Oh, it's wonderful, preacher. How about a lifetime of blessing? A whole lifetime of blessing. The Christian life is not an event, and it's not an experience, and it's not an emotion. Look, please, God didn't design the Christian life to be lived one day. He designed it to be lived every day, and the only way to live it victoriously is in the blessing of his presence. And so what does a lifetime of blessing look like? Well, let's walk through the passage. And before I walk you through the passage, can I just remind you of something? This book, this whole book is a book of blessing. Sin brings a curse, God brings a blessing. Say that, please. Sin brings a curse, God brings a blessing. Tell somebody next to you, ready? Sin brings a curse, God brings, that's pitiful. I want you to preach it to them. Get your pointing finger out. Point at that sinner and say it, ready? Sin brings a curse, God brings a blessing. Look, God made Adam and Eve. Everybody remember that? Do you remember what he did? First thing, as soon as he made them, the ne very next verse says God blessed them. Law of first mention. Do you understand from the very beginning God's intention was to bless man, not to make him everlasting miserable, but to pour out heaven's blessing on earth and the divine blessing into humankind? That was God's intention from the very beginning. The sweet psalmist of Israel takes pen in hand and begins to write. And what is the first of the psalms? Look, blessed is the man. Jesus stands up and begins his first and most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And what's the title of that sermon? It's the blessing sermon. He stands up and the first word out of his mouth is blessed. And if that were not enough, it's blessed, 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 blessed. That's a whole lot of blessing in one sermon. And Jesus departs. He leaves them on that mountain outside of Jerusalem and ascends back up into heaven. What's the last thing he does? He raises his hand as only a high priest can and he blesses them as he goes up. Oh, I love that thought. The last time they saw Jesus, his hands were raised in blessing. Friend, I want to tell you, the nail-pierced hands of Jesus are still raised in blessing at the throne of God tonight. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation 1 and Revelation 22, what does God say? Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy of this book and keep those things that are written therein. For the time is at hand. I say to you, from Genesis to Revelation, from eternity past to eternity future, God is the God of blessing. And God desires to bless his people now. How many of you are glad you don't have to wait till you die to get the blessing? And that's right, you don't have to wait for the rapture in heaven to know the joy of Jesus. You can know it right now. And so we come to our text. Look at verse 24. And of Asher he said, Let Asher be blessed with children. Here's the first blessing in a lifetime of blessing. Number one, isn't it interesting? That it's not things, it's not stuff. No, it's the greatest treasure. Write it down. Number one, the great blessing of sons and daughters. The children that God graciously gives to his servants. Now that may be your own children. How many of you have children of your own? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Tammy and I have three children that all look like their mother. Hallelujah for that. Morgan's 22 now. I can't believe it. She's married to a young preacher and they're serving in a wonderful church. Lauren is 20 and serving the Lord in a wonderful school. 
Uh, Grant is 17, a senior in high school. I can't believe it. How'd that happen? How'd I get this old? And yet, may I say to you, the greatest blessings of my life are wrapped up in those children. There's no joy like the joy of knowing your children walk in truth. No joy like that. That doesn't mean they always do right. In fact, a lot of days they don't do right. But I've discovered something. The greatest gifts that God gives to us is the next generation. And please don't miss this. You may say, well, I, I don't have children, or, or our children are grown, or whatever. Whatever the answer may be in your thinking. Do you understand Titus chapter number 2? This is the way God's work always perpetuates itself. It's always the older generation and the younger generation. I, I used a term earlier for my dear uncle. I said he's one of my spiritual fathers. Now, we're related by, by blood, but we've we, we got a closer connection than that because God has used him like a Paul with a Timothy to teach me some things. Do you understand? That's not just about family. That's a part of the family of God. It's the greatest joy of all. May I say to the older generation represented in this room, and that, you know, older is relative, isn't it? So if you're wondering, is he talking to me? You all figure that out amongst yourselves, all right? I, I'm not getting into the whole age discussion tonight. At this point in my life, I'm 46. I'm, I'm halfway to 92. I'm pretty excited about it. And I'm starting to think more about the finish line than the starting blocks. It's interesting, isn't it, how there's a subtle shift in life and you cross a certain threshold. But I understand age is all relative, what's younger and what's older. But please don't miss the principle. The principle is this, that what somebody faithfully handed to us as sons and daughters must now be in turn handed to the sons and daughters coming along behind us. It's the greatest privilege we have. It's the greatest joy we have. Look, look, the great thing about this church is not buildings. You've got wonderful buildings, but look, the building comes, the building goes. The, the building ages, and the building has to be updated. But well, look, please, the greatest thing going on in this church is young couples and children and teenagers and another generation of sons and daughters getting the truth of God in them. This is the greatest blessing of all. A few weeks ago, I had preached in a, a men's conference on a Saturday and was leaving on Monday to fly to the West Coast to speak. And I said to my wife, I'm not going to schedule a meeting on Sunday. She looked at me kind of funny. She said, you're not going to schedule anything on Sunday? And I said, no, I'm just going to go to church with you all. She said, like a normal church member? I said, like a normal church member. I'm hardly ever in our home church, especially on Sunday. And I said, don't, don't tell anybody. I'm just going to go to church today. Dad found out about it, and he said, you preach this morning. I said, nope, I came to listen to the pastor. And so I sat there and enjoyed the service immensely, and Dad preached. I'm standing on the front row, and in the invitation, I felt something to my side, and my son had been seated across the auditorium, and he came over and put his arm around me. I looked at him, there was tears in his eyes. He said, Dad, he said, I've been dealing with this for weeks in my heart. He said, I just wanted to be sure before I told anybody he said, but I believe in my heart God has called me to preach. <laughs> and I thought to myself, the Lord orchestrated that, you see. My dad preaching, me there on the day that God spoke to him. I can't tell you what that meant to me. And I'm going to tell you some, some of the things that we fuss about and some of the things we work so hard for, they mean less and less the more you get a glimpse of what really matters in light of eternity. Look, a lot of this junk isn't going to matter someday. Let me tell you what's going to matter. The blessing of the sons and daughters God has given to us. That's not all. Look again at verse number 24. Let Asher be blessed with children. Then let him be acceptable to his brethren. Write this down. Here's the blessing of God's smile. When I first read this, I thought, well, that means everybody accepts him. But actually, what it means is God gives him favor. How many of you know that you can't be accepted by everybody? Hey, look, this is really not about Asher, and this is really not about his brethren. I love this. This is about God, because God is the one who always gives favor. And when the Lord smiles upon you, the Lord makes a way for you. You don't force your way through and make it happen and get it done. Look, you're just in the flow with God. When you have the blessing of the Lord, the Lord makes a way for you. 
Oh, keep reading. Uh, look, of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. Somebody said, that's just strange, preacher. I don't want to dip my foot in oil. It's a beautiful symbolism, and the people of the day would have understood it. But would you write it down? Here's the blessing of supply. You see, oil in Scripture is always symbolic of, of benefit, of blessing. Uh, the, the high priests, they were anointed with oil. Oil was a beautiful thing in that culture and that custom. And by the time you get to the New Testament, the oil is symbolic, really, of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, I love this thought. God says to Asher, I'm not only going to give you children and help you with your brethren, then I'm going to pour my own spirit on your life. What supply? We've been blessed. How many blessed people are here tonight? You had clothes to wear. That's obvious because there's no naked people in here tonight, so that's good. You had some means of getting here. You have some place to pillow your head tonight. How many of you have eaten in the last 24 hours? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, multiple times for most of us. Some of us are already thinking what we're going to eat when the preacher stops preaching tonight, right? We're spoiled rotten. That's what we are. But the supply I'm talking about is not the supply of things. It is the supply of God's presence. Friend, there's nothing like it. I can be surrounded by people, but if I don't have the sense of the Lord's presence, it's miserable. And I can be all alone in a hotel room somewhere, and if the Lord is there, it's wonderful. Why? Because there's nothing like the oil of gladness being poured upon you, the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit. I like what H.A. Ironside said. Ironside said, when a man's foot is dipped in oil, which, by the way, that's a picture of extravagance. Look, usually the oil went on the head. He said there's so much oil, which was very costly and pricey in that day. He said he's taking a foot bath in oil. That's a lot of oil right there. Look, aren't you glad our God's a God of abundance and extravagance? It's not just enough to eke by and endure. It's not just enough to get through. No, our God is the God of the much more, the path of the just as the shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. Stop living like a pauper and a prodigal when your father has bread enough and to spare. Live in the extravagance and the supply of the sweet Holy Spirit. But Ironside said, I love this picture. He said, when a man's foot is dipped in oil, it means he lives, leaves prints everywhere he walks. I'm going to tell you what we need. We need some of God's children to get so near to the Lord and so full of the Holy Spirit that everywhere they walk and everywhere they go, they leave behind them a trail of the blessings of God. You know that phrase? I thought about it a minute ago in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. How many of you know that phrase? Now, usually we preach that phrase this way, oh, that goodness and mercy is nipping at my heels, and it's the Lord's sheepdogs, you know. And the, the shepherd uses goodness and mercy to keep me moving in the right direction. I do believe that is true, but do you understand in the agriculture of the day that everywhere the sheep went, they were called the animals of the golden hoof because everywhere they went, they ate up all the stuff that didn't need to be there, and they fertilized the ground really well, and when they left, everything was better because they had been there. I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe the goodness and mercy is not just for us to enjoy. I think the goodness and mercy is for us to share with other people. And everywhere we go, friends, the goodness and mercy of God ought to be trailing along behind us. In our wake, other people ought to be coming to know the goodness and glory of our gracious God. I say to you, we are a blessed people, and we are to be a blessing to other people. And so look at it. He says he'll dip his foot in oil. Let me just show you something. We got a second. Turn back to Genesis 49 real quick, just for a minute. I said to you earlier, compare Scripture with Scripture. Let me just show you Asher's verse, just one verse. Look at Genesis 49, verse 20. This is powerful. Out of Asher. Would you mark the first two words? What's the first two words, class? Out of, say that please, out of. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. I miss this. I miss this for the longest time. We have this idea that the, that the bread was just so he could be blessed. 
that the royal dainties were for him to enjoy. Are you reading Joshua? Do you know that, that his, his allotment in the land, in the promised land, was right on the coastline, right on the Mediterranean Sea? Can you imagine a more beautiful, fertile place in all the world for God to plant you? But watch this. Please don't miss this. God did not just plant Asher there so Asher could have lots of oil and lots of fruit and lots of bread and lots of royal dainties to keep to himself. Look, it is our of Asher that lots of other people were going to be fed. How many of you know the name William Borden? Borden of Yale? He died when he was about 25 in Cairo, Egypt. The famous story, no reserve, no retreats, no regrets. That was William Borden, the young millionaire, going to be a missionary. He went to chapel one day at Yale University and a man was speaking by the name of S.D. Gordon. S.D. Gordon spoke out of that passage in John 7 where Jesus said of the Holy Spirit when he comes that out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. And two little words captured Borden that day, out of. And he wrote in his journal later that day, he said, I've learned a very valuable truth today. The world's way is into and the Lord's way is out of. I'm going to tell you part of the problem in our churches today. We're so stinking selfish and concerned about ourselves. We have forgotten why God left us here to start with. We're, we're consumers. That's what we are. We're a bunch of consumers. And excuse me, we're getting fatter all the time more spiritually bloated than we've ever been. We've got more sermons and Christian radio and media and books and meetings and conferences and, excuse me, ad nauseum people talking about spiritual things. Where's the power of God? I'll tell you this, God doesn't give his power so you can enjoy it. God gives his power so it can use you to make a difference in this world. And I say to you tonight, one of the greatest blessings of all is just being used of God. And Asher's used of God. So go back to Deuteronomy 33 and look at the list again. Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Let him dip his foot in oil. I like this one. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. So you got it? You got the blessings of sons and daughters, the blessing of God's smile, the blessing of divine supply. Now you have the blessing of security. God says, I know you got enemies, but I'm going to take care of them. Look at the shoes. He said, your shoes shall be iron and brass. How many of you think that sounds like some heavy-duty shoes? Somebody said, I don't know, preacher, if I really want iron and brass shoes or not. Now, look, here's the idea. God says, the enemies are going to come, but you're just going to. First promise of Messiah, Genesis 3.15. God looked Satan, that serpent, in the face and says, I just want you to know the seed of the woman's coming. He's going to bruise your head. Now, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. How many of you know there's a difference between a heel bruise and a head wound? You ever had a heel bruise? Painful, aren't they? Make you hobble around for a couple days, get you some pity and sympathy, you know. Anybody in here ever heard of somebody dying of a heel bruise? No, you'll get over it. Give it a few days, you're going to be all right. But a head wound, now that's another thing entirely. Listen to me. Satan may bruise the heel of the lovely Lord Jesus, but I want you to know when Jesus came out of that grave with the keys of death held on the grave in his hand, he put his nail-pierced foot squarely on the head of that old serpent, the devil, and on that day, he was a defeated foe. And Romans 15 says, someday soon, the Lord is going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Oh, I love that. The only way he can be under our feet is when we are seated with him. And that's going to happen. When? Shortly. But here he says the enemies will come, but you have shoes of iron and brass to be able. Don't miss this. Shoes are not just for standing. Shoes are for moving. He says you're going to move forward. You're going to make it. My pastor that I served under for all those years has had, I think, 11 reconstructive spine surgeries now, neck surgeries. And there are times to watch him walk. You know he's exerting a great deal of energy just Moving forward, he said to me one day, and I don't think anybody in the world could have said it and would have meant any more to me because I knew what he was dealing with. He said, you know, Scott, he said, some days it's just like the rest of life. Sometimes the only thing you can do is the hardest thing to do. I said, what's that, Pastor? He said, just put one foot in front of another. 
May I say to you tonight what God's people need to do? You just need to put one foot in front of another and keep moving forward and believe God is going to take care of the enemies and God is going to take care of you. By the way, the word used for shoes here is the same word they used in that day for bolts. Imagine the gates of a city. He said the bolts are on really tight. Look, please. And the, the gates are shut and you are secure and you are safe. In other words, God is saying in every picture imaginable to his people, I got you and I've got this under control. And then we come to the last phrase and the most famous and. As thy days... So shall thy strength be. How many of you have ever had to claim that one? You should. This is one of those verses every now and then you ought to just put your finger on and say, Lord, I'm going to claim that today for myself. The days we feel weak as water, don't we? Would you write down number five? Here's the blessing of strength. And I love the, the connection with the shoes in the same verse because look, how is life lived one step at a time? One day at a time, one moment at a time, God gives strength moment by moment. Moody said it's like this. How do you draw air? One breath at a time. How do you draw strength from the Lord? One breath at a time. There are moments on the road where I honestly, preacher, I don't even feel like preaching mind muddied and just tired and weary with something. And it's the most amazing thing in the world because I can sit there and physically and mentally just not feel at all like even speaking and just say to the Lord, now, Lord, I, I have to have your strength right now. And the Lord, look, my strength always fails, but the Lord's strength never fails. And I don't know what you're dealing with right now, but I'm saying to you, for whatever step you have to take and for whatever battle is facing you and whatever enemy is coming against you, the Lord's strength is more than enough. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. The old preacher, Philip Doddridge, went through a season in his life of great depression. He was walking along to the village where he pastored one day. I was reading the story this week, just walking along, and he said he was in the mully grubs. He was just gloom and doom, and everything was bad. And he passed a cottage. Aren't you glad God makes divine appointments for us? He passed a cottage, and inside the cottage, he heard a little boy reading the Bible out loud. His mama had made him read it, I'm sure. And would you like to know what verse he was reading when Doddridge walked by the open window? Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And Philip Doddridge said at that moment, it was like the Lord went and breathed fresh strength into his soul. I say to you, only the Lord can put that kind of strength in you. No preacher can preach that down Nobody can stir that up in you. No, the Lord has to give you his strength. But you know when he gives it? I love this. He gives his strength when you come to the end of yours. Because the end of us is the beginning of him. People say, well, you know, preacher, I think my best days are behind me. Nonsense. How many saved people are here? Raise your hand big and high. The best day you're ever going to live is the day you see Jesus face to face, and that's ahead of you. So if that's true, friend, bet your best days are still ahead of you. In fact, you've got a lot of really good days ahead of you, a whole eternity full of them. I wonder if the tribe of Asher knew, knew all that God was going to do with them. If you fast forward to Luke chapter number 2, uh, there's a, a woman there named Anna. How many of you remember Anna the prophetess? And she's waiting for the Messiah, and she gets to put her eyes on him, and she worships and praises and runs all over Jerusalem telling everybody because she, she had lived with the expectation, with anticipation all of her life that God had more for her and more for the nation of Israel. Would you like to guess what tribe she came from? It's right there in Luke chapter 2. The Holy Ghost tells us she was of the tribe of Asher. 
May I tell you what I believe? I believe that the people of Asher had known such blessing and joy and abundance that they lived with high expectations instead of low expectations. And maybe that's what some of God's children need to start doing again. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. That doesn't mean there's not trouble and heartache. There's lots of it to go around. She was just a little girl. Both of her parents died. Her name was Annie Johnson. Just a little girl. Mom and dad now, both dead. Too many children to be cared for, and they split them up. And a nice couple, a Christian couple, adopted her. Uh, their last name was Flint, so she became Annie Johnson Flint. And when she was eight, she trusted Jesus as her Savior. It was the means of her getting the gospel, and she got saved. It's wonderful. She grew up. She had a good life. When she was a young woman, both of her adopted parents died. She was a school teacher. She started teaching school. She was so excited, just a young woman starting out. And one day she noticed her hand not working right, and suddenly it got worse, progressively worse, and she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you have a certain kind of arthritis. You'll be a cripple the rest of your life. And in a matter of time, that beautiful young woman, with all of her parents gone, started crippling up. She would live the rest of her life in a wheelchair. They said for 40 years of her life, she did not live a single day without pain. Can you imagine? Not a day without pain. I was reading about her life this week. They said that on her deathbed, the doctor asked her something, and the last words, I love this, the last words she ever spoke were these, it's all right. I thought, here's a woman that could have said, it's all gone wrong. And the last words she ever uttered were these, it's all right. She was quite a poet. She wrote lots of beautiful things. But one day, she wrote these words. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we've exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. Fear not that your need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting, availing. The Father, both you and your load, will abear. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known in a man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. May I say to you tonight, if a hurting woman can write those words, surely we can live them. One little footnote and I'll be done. A word of warning for blessed people. What book follows Deuteronomy, please? Look at it, please. What's the next book? Joshua. What was coming in Joshua? Battles. Lots of battles. Do not ever think that the blessings mean there are no battles. No, they'll come. What book follows Joshua, please? You can read it for yourself, but if you read Judges chapter number 1, Judges chapter number 2, you know what you're going to find? Asher failed. That's right. They got in the land of Canaan. Now, they had shoes of iron and brass. They had God on them. They had everything they needed. But they saw a group of enemies, and they said, you know, we think we can live with them. And the Bible says they did not drive them out. Would you please hear me with your heart for just a second? Just because you have the blessing doesn't mean you're going to win the battle. God's blessing does not ensure your victory. It only provides for it. You and I have to choose it every day. The question is not whether we're going to be blessed, friends. We're already blessed. The question is, what are we going to do with it? And tonight, I'd like to say, Lord, I'd like it to be more than a day or a year of my life. 
I'd like to have a lifetime of blessing.